cumbered. So hopefully this will help. Okay, we'll have a short poll at the end um, and then we will have Q&A. Let me read you a very brief summary of Donna's impressive background. Donna Washington is an internationally known master storyteller, artist educator, and published author who has been performing for audiences of all ages for over 33 years. She's renowned for her storytelling for both children and adults, from poignant and funny fables about the human condition to racy relationship stories to spine-tingling tales of terror. She has performed for groups from intimate house parties to school classrooms to 2,000-seat festivals and theaters. Donna's 11 storytelling CDs have garnered 28 national awards. She has authored numerous articles about storytelling and education, including her very popular blog, Language, Literacy, and Storytelling. She is the, also the author of four children's books, Little Rabbits, Kwanzaa, A Pride of African Tales, The Story of Kwanzaa, and A Big Spooky House. She travels all over the world, performing and giving workshops, but she lives with her husband and two cats in Durham, North Carolina. She also went to Northwestern. <laughs> You can find out more about her on her website, DonnaWashington.com. And without further ado, I am going to remove myself from the screen, as you all, you all request, and Donna has, the, Donna has the stage. Welcome. Thank you so much. Wow. It is wonderful to be here, uh, even though we're distant. Uh, yeah, so I am indeed Donna Washington. I love what I do. I love being a storyteller. And today, we're going to be doing one of my one-woman shows called uh, Through Their Own Eyes. And it's the reason why this, this came up was because I am an army brat. My father was uh, stationed all over the world when I was a kid. I spent time in Germany, I spent time in Asia, and I spent time in several different states in America. But the first time that I remember studying about early American history, really studying it, was when I was in seventh grade, and I was in a history class. And my history teacher started talking about slaves. And I was the only black child in that honors history class. And almost, you could feel the tension in the air when we were talking about slaves and the students sitting around me, trying to look at me out of the side of my eye as if somehow this was an embarrassing thing for me. They were uncomfortable that they were talking about this in front of me. And as I grew up, Every time this came up in a classroom somewhere, and I was one of a few or the only black person there, somehow it was all about me. They were, you know, and someone would ask a question, and somehow I was supposed to be the person defending or speaking about slaves or slavery. And I, I realized as I got older that the problem here is that the way we talk about this in education and in our society a lot of times isn't useful. It doesn't help us understand what it was or how it was. And for a big chunk of the population, it's embarrassing and uncomfortable. We don't want to talk about that. That that was a dark time. It's over. It's finished. Why are we still talking about this? Well, there's a reason why we're still talking about this. Because it isn't over. Because the stories that grew out of this period in our history are still affecting how we go forward. And I wish that when I was a kid and we were talking about this in schools, we could have talked about it differently. We could have spoken about it differently. But how could we do that when the people who write the textbooks 
are usually typically white men who are trying to say something with words that they're uncomfortable using. There is a voice missing from this story, and it is the voice of the African Americans who were living through it. They weren't allowed to read and write. They weren't allowed to speak up without being in trouble. Nobody wanted to hear what they had to say. And in fact, there were lots of stories that grew out of why it was okay to enslave African Americans. But their stories are still there. The voices are still there. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is I'm going to shift the perspective. Instead of telling this tale of African Americans in America from the point of view of the people who enslaved them, I'm going to tell the story from the point of view of the people who had to live through it. And their stories do exist, and they're oral. There are folk history. And let's start by reframing what happened to the first Americans that were brought from Africa. Imagine if you have a population of people and some of them are strong and some of them are weak and some of them are sick and some of them are healthy, all sorts of things. And you take that entire population and you stick them in the pins on the Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast of Africa. Some of them aren't going to make it, the sickest, the weakest, the people who aren't clever enough to figure out a way to survive, they're not going to make it. You're going to lose them. And then you're gonna take those people and you're gonna put what's left on a boat you got to pack them in on ships and send them across the ocean. Not all of them are going to survive either. The weakest, the people who have the least ability to go into their imaginations to find some reason to live, the people who aren't strong enough to find something to hold on to, you're going to lose them. So on the other side of the ocean, what have you got? You have got the angriest, the strongest, the smartest, the most determined group of an entire population. That's all that survived. And that is the group they tried to enslave. When you look at it like that, then all sorts of things in the history of what it meant to be African American in this country makes more sense. Of course, we got Sojourner Truth. Of course, we had Phyllis Wheatley. Of course, we had Harriet Tubman. Of course, we had Frederick Douglass. Of course, we did. They weren't anomalies. They grew organically out of the people who were here. And I do not use the word slave. A slave is something that you are. The people who were brought here were enslaved. Enslaved is something somebody did to you. So let us tell the stories that were told to survive. And one of the first ones was about Oloshun, the goddess of the moon. She is a West African goddess and she's part of the Orisha. And the story goes that when the enslaved people were first brought onto the ships, they weren't shackled together. Where could they possibly go? And there was a child who went to stand on the, the, the ship's deck and looked into the water just over the edge. And there in the moonlight, there was a path and Olashun herself, the goddess of the moon, opened up the ocean and looked up at him and said, do not fear. I will show you a way out. In five nights, the moon will be full. You bring as many people as you can up here to the deck and you come down to me and I will keep you safe at the bottom of the sea. The little boy was quite surprised and he went down and he told his mother, who was in great despair about this, that he had seen the sea goddess, the, the moon goddess, and, and she had said to come into the sea. And his mother told him that he was dreaming, that it wasn't real, it wasn't true. But other people heard, other people listened. And each night he went to the ship's deck and looked over, and each night more and more people came and looked over. And each night the goddess of the moon spoke to them and said, now four nights now three nights, now two nights, one more night. And the little boy kept spreading that message all over that ship. And do you know, when the moon was full, hundreds of those people came and Olashun opened up a path 
into the kingdom at the bottom of the sea and in they went and down into that kingdom. And though we are here on this soil and though we are chained, you remember there is a kingdom full of beautiful black people at the bottom of the ocean and they are singing and they are dancing because they weren't afraid. So don't you be afraid. When you find your chance for freedom, you take it. The stories that we told to keep ourselves alive were about being free of being enslaved. We sang about it. In our churches, we sang about it. In our stories, we told about it. There, some of you may have gone to school and read about how some slaves were treated well. They were treated well, they were given enough to eat, they were given some place to stay. Uh, one of our senators, whose name I shall not say here, recently said that slavery was a necessary evil. I wonder if he would feel that way if it had been his ancestors who had been enslaved. The way we tell these stories matters. In order to keep the people enslaved, it became important to pretend they weren't really people, that they were lesser somehow, less intelligent, less able, less capable. It's not that we were really stopping them from reading and writing. What good would that do them? They, they couldn't do anything with it. They couldn't take care of themselves. It was the story that got perpetuated, told over and over and over until the people who told it felt they were doing something quite wonderful, keeping their slaves because these people couldn't take care of themselves. They were barely human. And even as that was the story that was being perpetrated all around them and perpetuated through society, they were telling their own stories. This one comes from a book by Virginia Hamilton called The People Could Fly. It is the story that gives the title to that book. You see, they say a long time ago in Africa, there were a people who could fly. They could walk up on the air just as easily as you walk in, walking upon a gate. And their wings were such that their beautiful black bodies would blot out the sun as they went from place to place. But then the slave catchers came and took the people who could fly and put them into the pens and they despaired. And not all of them made it. And then they were taken and shackled onto the ships and they forgot who they were. It's hard to fly with iron on your arms and on your legs. And by the time they got to the other side, they had forgotten who they were. And it just so happened that all many of them ended up on the same plantation. And they were out working in the fields. And Sarah was out there and she had a baby on her back and it was crying because it was hungry. She'd fed it before she'd come out to work, but it was hungry and it was hot and she knew she needed to feed the baby, but she was afraid if she stopped, the overseer would come over and hurt her, beat her, hit her. And so she bounced the baby and she sang and she tried to work, hoping that would stop the baby, but the baby was hungry. The baby didn't want to sleep. The overseer came over and said, keep that thing quiet. And she kept her head down and she bounced a little harder and she sang a little louder, but the baby was hungry. And the overseer was furious and he took out his whip and lashed her legs and she fell to the ground her blood mingling with the soil. And the overseer said, keep it quiet, then get up and get back to work. She knew she would be punished if she didn't get her quota in, but she took the baby off and she started nursing the baby. Old Toby was there that day. He was giving people water, he was too old to work. And he shuffled over to her and offered her water. At least that's what it looked like he was doing. But what he was really doing was whispering into her ear, reminding her of who she was. And when he stood up, there was a different light in her eyes and she came up off the ground and she didn't stop there. She went straight up into the air. She turned her face north and she flew off. 
Well, the overseers hadn't been looking at that direction. They certainly didn't realize what was going on. And at the end of the day, they were one slave short. And they went to the master. They said, she must have run off when we wasn't looking. He was so angry. He said, you figure this out. You better find her. They sent out the dogs. They sent out the slave catchers, but they couldn't find her. She was gone. Well, the next day, there was a young man in the fields named Jonathan. And Jonathan was working as hard as he could. But Jonathan started getting hot and he, he fell over. And, and the overseer came over and hit him and told him to get up and told him to get up. And he kept saying he was sorry, but he was thirsty. And the overseer said, you better get up, boy. And he said, I'll get up. And old Toby came over with the water and the overseer just threw his hands up. He knew that Jonathan was just being lazy. And he walked off. And old Toby gave Jonathan some water. It looked like that's what he was doing, but really, he leaned down and whispered in his ear, reminding him of who he was. And when he walked off, old Jonathan, he stood up, but he didn't stop. He went up and up and up and up, turned his head north and took off for freedom. And at the end of the day, when they were counting, they were another slave short. And they could not figure out how he'd gotten away. They thought they were keeping pretty good eye on everything. And they went back to the man who called himself their master. And he ex they explained what happened. He said, you keep an eye out. Don't you lose any more my slaves. Well, the next day, because they wanted to see what was happening, they just picked one at random. And they beat him till he fell down, told him to get up, laughed at him, and walked away. But this time, they were watching. And this time, they were ready. Old Toby showed up, he gave that man some water, whispered into his ear, and of course, as soon as he left, that man not only stood up, he came straight up off the ground. Well, the overseers couldn't believe what they were seeing, but they did know something. They knew that each time this had happened, old Toby had been involved. And so they turned to him and they said, that's the one, he's taught them how to escape. Get him! And they set the dogs loose. They meant to grab old Toby. And they ran at him with the whip, seeming to bind old Toby. And he just started laughing. He said, don't you know who we are? We are the people who can fly. And he raised his hands and he started singing. And the dogs stopped, and all the men stopped, and some of the people on that plantation, they heard that singing, and they remembered who they were. And they rose right up off the ground until they were all standing up there in the sky in a circle around old Toby, like they was going to do a ring sing. And he looked down at them, and he just waved goodbye. Now, there were some people on that plantation who didn't come from that stock, who didn't know how to fly. And they dropped their hoes and their shovels and they, they reached up and they said, take us with you. And he said, I can't, I can't teach you how to fly, but you don't need to do what we're doing. You got your own wings. Use your feet and the second you can run. And old Toby turned his eyes north and his people went with him and they went all the way north, all the way to freedom, all the way to Canada. And I know this is true because old Toby and his people, well, they stayed in Canada and they raised their children, they raised their children, and they raised their children until one of their children told me. And that's the story of the people could fly. Those were the kinds of stories that were going on at night. Those were the kind of stories that were passed between people back and forth across different plantations all over the South. There are all kinds of stories about people flying away, disappearing in the night. And if they did, someone would say, well, they must have flown away. It is possible to be free of this, even in the midst of the darkness, even in the midst of feeling so pressed down that you could not stand. The enslaved people found ways to think about freedom and think about getting away. But it wasn't all stories of darkness. Oh no, they had a lot of stories that made you laugh too. Most of you, well maybe, I don't know, I, I might be wrong, but many of you I'm sure have heard of Br'er Rabbit. Now, in the 60s, I believe it was the 60s, might have been the early 50s, Disney broke Br'er Rabbit. 
He broke it because Joel Chandler Harris had heard these stories growing up and then Disney loved Br'er Rabbit. Who wouldn't? He's a great character. And they bought the rights and they created a horrifyingly inappropriate movie about Br'er Rabbit. But at the time, it didn't seem so. But they made this movie about this singing, dancing, you know, happy slave person, Uncle Remus, and they, you know, use the characters. But the thing is, is that the problem they had was they had appropriated something they didn't understand. And it's not their fault. Joel Chandler Harris didn't understand it, probably. Br'er Rabbit is the spirit of the African-American people. And he's based on a trickster character that comes from Africa a spider whose name is Anansi. Now Anansi the spider uh, is a trickster character. He does all kinds of stuff and occasionally he gets caught in his own tricks. Uh, and sometimes he gets away with it, but gets away with it. But a lot of times he gets caught. There's a story about how Anansi was stealing from his mother. And it was back in the day when uh, spiders had long, beautiful hair like mine. Oh yeah, they used to wear their hair and wear their fine hats. And he was stealing from his mother. And on her way into the house, he realized she was coming back and he put hot peanuts in his hat. And then he didn't want to see the smoke coming out of his hat. So he put the hat on top of his head and burned all the hair off the top of his head, which is why spiders are bald. So, or they have little crunchy spikes sticking up here and there. So he gets caught in his traps. But when the African-Americans were brought here to America, when they were brought here, they weren't allowed to speak their languages or tell their stories or worship their own religions. So Anansi could not be there with them. So they turned him into a rabbit and he became Br'er Rabbit. Br'er is a shortened form of the word brother. And all of these stories are about one thing. If you have a problem, best you think your way out of it because if you don't and you try to fight your way out of it, your problem will get bigger. These stories were a way for African-Americans to pass knowledge to each other. But they were also the thing that I think Disney did not know and certainly Joel Chandler Harris didn't know. They were a way of laughing at the white people around them. They were aware of making fun of the people who had enslaved them. And the, the enslavers had no idea that that's what was happening. So when you hear Br'er Rabbit stories and you hear about Br'er Fox, the big, you know, rabbit thinks, he, uh, thinks he's really clever, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Bear, who's big and slow and dumb, these were not characters that they thought of as themselves. They are Br'er Rabbit. The African-Americans are Br'er Rabbit. The big dumb characters are the enslavers, the white people around them. So when you look at those stories and you see how Br'er Rabbit is getting around those people, it isn't that he's tricking other black folks, he's tricking the white people. Here's a set of stories for Br'er Rabbit that some of you have probably heard before. And just so we're clear, Br'er Rabbit is not a racist creature in terms of saying something bad about black people. Disney made a movie that was really horribly inappropriate. The stories themselves, historically, they're about lifting up people of color. Here's one, like I said, that most of you would probably know. Now, it's a participation story. And even though I cannot hear you, you can participate where you are. I will feel your participation. Because uh, in African-American folklore, one of the things that's really big when you're doing a big social story is something called call and response, which is something that came in from Africa as, a way, as part of entertainment. So I'm going to ask you to do something with me. I hope you'll do it. Now, one morning, Br'er Rabbit was just a bouncing down the road. He was saying how do to everybody he saw. Now, I'm going to say how do to you. You're supposed to say how do back because that's how it works if y'all ever been to the South. All right. So he was bouncing on down the road. He said, how do to you? That's right. Everyone else said, how do back? He said, how do to you? That's right. They said, how do back? How do to you? That's right. Now, everyone knows that's what you're supposed to do. And Brad Bear and Brad Fox, they was watching that critter bounce on down, say how do to everybody. And Brad Fox got himself an idea. He said, I think I know how we can catch that critter. And Brabba said, hey, 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 how we gonna do it? How we gonna do it? Hey, hey, hey. Well, I'm gonna show you. 
Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear got themselves a whole lot of big old thick black sticky tar. And they, they piled up in three big old globs and then Br'er Fox Fox snatched the hat right off Br'er Bear's head and stuck that hat on him. And while Br'er Bear was reeling around, he ripped off Br'er Bear's coat and put it on the tar baby. And then he pulled two buttons off of that bear's clothes, popped them on for eyes, and then he pulled some hair right off his butt and popped it right on his forehead like it was hair underneath that hat. And then he grabbed that bear and they ducked into the, the bushes over there. Now, Br'er Rabbit was just going down the road saying, how do you do? Everybody said, how do you do? That's right. So, how do you do? That's right. And then he got to that tar baby. Now, I'm going to talk to the tar baby. Y'all don't need to respond this time because y'all not the tar baby, okay? All right, here we go. So we saw that tar baby. He said, how do you do? You? And he was getting ready to walk off, but the tar baby didn't say nothing. Bro, Rabbit stopped. He backed himself up. He said, excuse me. I said, how do to you? You supposed to say how do back. That's only proper. Won't you raise proper? We gonna try this again. How do to you? Tar baby didn't say nothing. <clears throat> Bro, rabbit got a mind upset. He said, this is very rude. When someone says how do to you, you supposed to say how do back. That's how this works. I'm gonna try again. <clears throat> how do to you? Tar baby didn't say nothing. Too stuck up. Well, Rabbit said, well, now I'm upset. I'm going to say how do to you. And you better say how do back. I'm going to pop you in the nose. How do to you. Tar Baby didn't say nothing. Brown Rabbit was so mad, he hauled his arm back and <laughs> sucked his arm right up into that sticky tar. He said, you better give my arm back. You better give it back. I'm going to hit you again. Tar Baby didn't give his arm back. Now he was stuck up to his elbows in the tar. Get my arm back. I'm going to kick you. He started wrestling with that tar, baby. Wrestled that thing all the way down until he was so stuck, only thing he could move was his eyeballs. Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear was laughing so hard they came out. They cleaned all that tar off that rabbit. They said, now nah, you in trouble. Yes, you are. That's what Br'er Fox said. Br'er Rabbit just kind of looked at him. And he said, now what we going to do with you? Br'er Rabbit said, well, I don't know what you want to do with me, but I'll tell you what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to throw me off yonder in that briar patch. And Br'er Fox said, <laughs> I think we're going to skin you alive. And Br'er Rabbit said, well, my coat gets a mite hot sometime. It's okay if you skin me alive. Just please don't throw me in the briar patch. And Br'er Fox said, no, no, we're not going to skin you alive. I think we're just going to drop you in boiling water. <laughs> boiling water for you. And Br'er Rabbit said, well, that's all right. I'm a little chilly myself right now, but uh, uh, please don't throw me in the briar patch. He said, Pfft. well, no, I know what we're going to do. We're going to hang you by your neck till you dead. And Br'er Rabbit was a feeling mighty scared at that point, but he didn't let on. He said, well, you can hang me up if you like. My feet get so walking around all the time, but please don't throw me in the briar patch. And finally, Br'er Fox looked over in yonder broad patch and he said, mm, because there was thick thorns every which way. He said, you know what I'm going to do to you? What are you going to do to me? I'm going to throw you in the briar patch. No, no. And that fox flung that rabbit. He went head over feet, over head over feet, over head of the feet, <clears throat> and landed right in the briar patch. And old Br'er Fox was listening because he was pretty sure old Br'er Rabbit was going to be cut to ribbons. He didn't hear nothing. He went over and looked down off in there. Br'er Rabbit was dancing around in there. He said, how you doing? Br'er Fox said, how come you not cut up? And Br'er Rabbit laughed. He said, I was born in this briar patch. It is exactly where I wanted to be. So the stories are about using your brain, laughing at what you, what you can't control. And, and knowing that in your stories, you have the upper hand because you know the truth. You're not what they think you are. Well, these stories went back and forth and back and forth. There's so many of them. 
and they inspired people to run. And of course, there were allies everywhere. The Underground Railroad was there. Their entire um, uh, denominations of uh, uh, religions that worked to help people get out of the South, to get out of slavery. And don't be mistaken, there were slaves up North too. People who had enslaved people up North. But it was a constant fight, a constant fight. And of course, eventually, it got to the point where the divided house could not stand and we came apart. And throughout the war, of course, at the beginning, Abraham Lincoln signed the, uh, the, um, the Emancipation Proclamation, which did not actually free the enslaved people. It just punished the people who had left the Union. It took longer to free everybody. But finally, Civil War ended. And technically, the slaves, the enslaved people in Texas, they were supposed to be freed from enslavement. They were supposed to be from freed, and they weren't because, well, first of all, there were not enough Union soldiers to go deal with Texas. It's huge. And the people who were enslaving them just didn't bother to tell them that they were supposed to be free. So June 19th, 1865, General George Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, discovered they were still practicing slavery there and said, excuse me, and made this proclamation that all the slaves were freed, that, that there is no more enslavement, it's over. And the enslaved people were like, really? Just like that? And a whole bunch of them just left. And they had this huge jubilee celebration, right? That was the last day that enslavement was legal in America. It, well, it was illegal before that, but it was the last day the, the African Americans found out that it was illegal. And so there was all this huge celebration. There was barbecues and dancing and laughter and people just gathered themselves up and left, which was quite shocking. <laughs> you know, if you think about uh, all the um, information about how some people treated their slaves well, and they left. Some people may stayed and made arrangements to work the land and get money for it. Some people demanded land. It was quite a raucous thing. And so June 19th, 1865, that is where Juneteenth comes from. That is why there are African-American families who celebrate Juneteenth instead of the 4th of July, because the 4th of July did not see freedom for African-Americans in this country. So it wasn't Independence Day for us. Now, after the Civil War, we had a chance to change the conversation in America, to deal with uh, what some people call the original sin of our country. We had the chance to do it, but there was a problem. The problem was, first, we had told stories about why African Americans needed to be enslaved. And those stories didn't disappear just because the Civil War ended. Ingrained in a huge group of people in our culture were the stories that African Americans could not take care of themselves. They were dirty, they couldn't do this, they weren't smart, they weren't this, they were lesser people. And in fact, there are budding sciences all over the place proclaiming their skulls are too small, their brains aren't completely developed. They have extra tendons in their legs. That's why they run so fast. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. But that stuff had moved from excuses people told themselves into reality for people. Today, you still have people trying to prove that the content of your skin, the melanin content, has something to do with the way your brain is put together outside and above any interactions you would have socially. But all of that started during the days of enslavement. And after the Civil War, we could have started reshaping that, but we didn't do that. We didn't reshape those stories. We kept telling them it was why there had to be other laws put in place to stop African-Americans from doing things because they couldn't. And then, there was a the whole business of how the North and South could get back together. We had to be one country and we did it over the bones and bodies of black people because we allowed the South to decide what the Civil War was about. 
and they did not want it to be about wanting to enslave a portion of the population. You know, on the other side of the world, that just didn't sound good. So they decided it was about states' rights. And they also decided that it was morally okay that they did this because somehow now the North was better understanding what they needed. And there was this push to pretend that there had been some big patriotic thing about the South, that they had principally left because they were feeling abused. It was about slavery, but we just didn't deal with it. So, so it was allowed for that to go forward, which is where you start seeing all of the sort of revisionist history, happy slave, enslaved people, you know, pictures of happy, joyful. They had enough to eat. They had a roof over their heads. It was enough. But that is not the story that the newly freed enslaved people told. And it's not the way they looked at it. Um, there are lots and lots of accounts of the last enslaved people who were still alive talking about what their lives were like. And you can find uh, those stories online. You can look them up. They tell a very different kind of story. And then we got into reconstruction. <laughs> and more laws were made to make sure black people did not forget who they were supposed to be. Whole societies of people showed up trying to prevent black people from owning homes. Laws got enacted. We're, no, voting is a bad thing. And of course the Klan came into being. And a lot of the rules that had kept African-Americans in line when they were enslaved, moved right over into the police and the laws that were enacted so that despite being freed, they were still being treated like enslaved peoples in the South. And that brought up a whole new round of stories like this one. It's called the white dog. Yvonne, had just started going to school. She went every day of the week except Saturday and Sunday. And she'd met a friend, a girl who didn't live right near where they lived. She lived on the other side of the railroad tracks. She lived in a, a, a really different neighborhood. Yvonne's father had a pretty good job and they'd bought a house on this side of the railroad tracks. And Yvonne really wanted to go visit her friend but there was a problem. You see, in, at night where they lived, the dragon would come out and the dragon would walk around and the dragon would make people disappear. So it was very important to always be inside in the dark. And in the winter time, well, there was a lot of dark. So Yvonne had started going to school. She'd met her friend. They'd become very good friends and she really wanted to visit her, but it was getting a little later on in the year and her mother hadn't been comfortable letting her go over across the railroad tracks earlier. And now Yvonne really wanted to go. And her mother said, well, maybe we'll see Saturday, maybe Saturday. Well, Yvonne was so excited and Friday night, her mother was tucking her into bed and Yvonne was looking out the window and a shooting star went across the sky. And she said, mother, I saw a shooting star. And her mother said, do you know what a shooting star is? She said, no. So the shooting star is an angel who's finished its good deed on earth and is going back to heaven. So Yvonne went to sleep that night with dreams of angels doing good deeds. And that Saturday, she got up and she and her mother had breakfast. She said, can I go to my friend's house? And not yet, not yet. Her mother said, not yet. We have some things to do. They went shopping. They got by. Can we go? Can I go? Can I go? And finally, her mother, after they had lunch, she said, yes, you can go, but only for a little while. You must be home before dark. I know, I know, I know, because the dragon will be out. I know, I promise. Well, it wasn't a far way to go. And her mother watched her go down the street and around the way. And then eventually she got to the railroad tracks and she went over the railroad tracks and not far from there, there was her friend's house and her friend was so excited to see her and they laughed, they had a good time, they ran around. And her friend's mother went in to make dinner. And Yvonne was supposed to go home, but she was having too much fun. You know what happens when you're having too much fun, right? Sometimes you just lose track of time and she lost track of time. And when she looked up, it was getting dark. 
And her friend said, run, run, you have to go home right now. And so Yvonne thought, oh, oh, I do, I do. I don't want to be out. And she started running. But it got dark faster than she had planned for. And when she got near the railroad tracks, the dragon was out. She could see it out there. All the men in the long, white, pointed hats. And they had dogs with them and torches, and they were yelling. Yvonne was terrified. She went and she hid behind some bushes. She was wondering if there was some way she could, she could get home, but she knew that the dogs would find her if, if, if she tried to go. Maybe she'd have to stay out here all night, and she was afraid to get up because if she started running back, they might see her, and she stayed behind that bush, and then she felt a wet nose on her cheek, and she looked, and one of their dogs was there, and it, she covered her face because her mother said, if you, if you see dogs, you should cover your face because they'll go for your face, but the dog didn't try to grab her or bite her just touched her nose again, up right up against her cheek. And then it started pulling at her clothes and she stood up and she put her hand on the dog and the dog walked right through the dragon. And she had her hand on the scruff of that dog's neck and the dog just walked with her right through the dragon and then down the street and around the corner and up the way. Her mother was on the porch and she saw Yvonne and she ran out and she grabbed her and she picked her up and she ran back in the house. She was crying, she was angry. You know how we get with our children. We're happy, we're angry, we're scared. And her mother said, what? where were you? Why didn't you come home? I was so scared. And she said, Mom, it was okay. The dog brought me home. And her mother said, dog? Said, you saw the dog. The dog, I'm sure we should let the dog in. And they opened the door and there was no dog. And that night, her mother was tucking her into bed. And Yvonne looked out the window and she saw a shooting star. It was her angel going back to heaven. And so our stories became about that, about surviving, about finding hope in the darkness, about understanding that even though sometimes it feels like there is no light, there is light. When Obama was running for president the second time, and the Republicans um, in Congress started, well, it, was, it, wasn't, it didn't start there. It started when the Supreme Court decided that the Voters' Rights Act was perfectly fine. We hadn't any problems, and so they just tore the heart out of it for a bit. And the very states who they had basically, you know, were, were prevented from putting laws in place about voting, and that's, that's who brought the suit, um, as soon as they struck down that part of the Voters' Rights Act, those exact states began to put the same laws in place that restricted voting for minorities that had been in place in the 1950s. And other states around the, the country began to do the same thing, making it hard for people of color to vote. And students, it also made it hard for students to vote. And my mother called me on the phone and she said, can you believe they're doing this again? And I said, what are you talking about? I know that these laws had been in the background. I mean, when I was in school, we talked about the restrictive laws. We talked about the grandfathering in. If your grandfather could vote, then you can vote. And then uh, the whole thing where you have to fill out this questionnaire, you have to take this test, you have to do all these crazy things, or you have to pay poll tax. And of course, that got struck down with the Voters' Rights Act. And now those things are back. Those kinds of things are back. And I said to my mother, well, I, there's nothing you can do. The Voters' Rights Act is over. She said, but it's been illegal. And then she started telling me this story. This amazing story from when she was a child that she'd never told me before. My mother didn't pass down her family stories to me because she didn't want me to hate the world. I knew a lot of the happier things, but in terms of trying to navigate from day to day, she grew up in segregated Texas. My parents did. And they did not want me to be angry. <laughs> That's how they explain it. So they just didn't tell us the stories of the things that they went through. We just picked up from where we were and went forward. 
And she told me this story about the thing that they had called when she was a child, the White Riots. In the 1950s in Beaumont, Texas, which is a little speck of a place in Texas, right around voting time in the fall, anytime there was going to be voting, word would come in from the wider community, from the white community into the bottoms where my great grandparents lived, that the riots were coming. And basically they would even tell you when it was coming and black people would either leave the neighborhood or they would hunker down in their homes. And on those nights, white men would come into their neighborhoods, break their windows, burn crosses on their lawns, kill their chickens, damage their property. And the whole point of this was there was a poll tax in Texas. And it was near enough to voting time, you would have to pick. Am I going to fix my property, get some more chickens? You know, how am I going to deal with this? Or am I going to save my money and vote? It was a way to stop people from voting. And it was a way to scare people so badly that they wouldn't vote, that they would promise they wouldn't vote. Well, one year when my mother and my uncle were living with my great grandparents, word came that the riots were coming. And my great grandfather just decided he'd had it. He did not want his great grandchildren to grow up with this thing that he had lived with as an adult man and that his children had had to live with. He just decided he wasn't going to put up with it. So he got together with his neighbors. They, the, Kent, the Kent Street, the street they lived on was a dead end street. And he basically said, I'm not leaving. And if they come in here, we need to tell them we're going to break their heads open. The neighbors thought, well, if we do that, we could all get lynched. He said, look, 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 I don't think it'll come to that. These guys are cowards. What we're going to do is we're just going to say we're going to break their heads open. We'll give them a, a moment to think twice about it. They won't come if they think we're going to fight back. So the men of Kent Street sent word out that they didn't want anybody coming and make a mess in their neighborhood. And that roiled the community. They're like, what do you mean you're going to break our heads open? Don't you dare. We're coming. So this went on for about a month back and forth. And then it, it was coming time and they realized, the men of Kent Street realized we might have to do something. So they dug the swales, which are the, the, um, the uh, ditches by the side of the road where the water goes into the little ducts that goes into the sewers. They dug the swales out and they thought, you know, they don't bring guns in here. They just mostly break stuff. Well, we have bricks. So they put bricks in the, the ditches with them. My great grandfather was the only one who had a gun. He had a hunting rifle. And Gil Bouvet, at the end of the, the cul de sac, at the end of the dead end street, he had a revolver from World War II that didn't fire. So the men thought, well, and if we have to do hand to hand, we could just take our shovels and our rakes. That would do some damage. So the first night the riots were supposed to come through, they all went and spent the, the night in those ditches waiting, and nothing happened. And they thought, well, maybe they won't come. The second night of that weekend, that Sunday, they were all in the ditches waiting and they heard the trucks coming down the road. And the way they would do this is they'd come to the neighborhoods with the lights off, then they'd shut the lights on and scream, holy terror, so that anyone who was still in the neighborhood would get up and grab their children and, and run out of the house because they weren't trying to hurt anybody. That would actually bring scrutiny. They were just trying to scare everyone and destroy their property. So, yeah, it was a terror thing. So they turn the lights on, they start screaming, and my grandfather just, my great-grandfather stood up underneath the street lamp. So I went on that street, and he aimed his rifle, his hunting rifle, right at the first car. And there was, eh, 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 eh. all of the trucks stopped all the way down the road. And there, there, were, there were men in the back of the trucks, and they were being thrown around. Everyone was yelling, what's going on, what's going on? And then they realized there's a man with a rifle and no one's moving. My grandfather's just standing there praying he doesn't have to shoot. The trucks are there. They're staring at him. Then Gil Bouvet got out of the ditch and came over and pointed his broken service right revolver. The men were looking at each other. Then all the men who were in the swales, they stood up and they were holding the butts of their ricks and their hose. It looked like they all had guns. They just really had gardening tools, but it looked like they all had guns. And very slowly, all of the trucks backed down the road and left the neighborhood. And my mother said that was the last year that they tried to do that. I asked my uncle about this and he said, yeah, for the next couple years, 
if there were going to be riots anywhere, the men at Kent Street went and got into the, sweat, the ditches, but they never did come down in our neighborhood again. And I asked my uncle, I said, how did you manage that? Like, what, what made them at that moment decide they were going to do that? He said, you can only push a man so far before everything explodes. And I thought, that's true. You can only push someone so far before things explode. Think about what happened in the 60s. Think about all of the people pouring into the streets. There were lots of black people and white people. Women at that point were saying, we need more say in what happens to our lives. That moment where everything just explodes. And some people, they're so angry, they destroy things. And some people are so sad, they become know, desperately bereft. And some people, they march, they're angry and they yell and say, hear me, see me. And some people are thinking about what comes next. And the 60s brought us all of that. But the stories that we had ingrained in our society about what it meant to be black in America without ever asking black people what it was, those stories still exist. It's still easy to dismiss black people. They don't know what they're talking about. It's still easy to dismiss them. They're not as competent or as capable. capable. It's still easy to fall into the stories that we tell. Recently, I was on a thread on Facebook. I was just reading the thread and someone asked the question, well, MLK, why did he get rid of racism? And Obama was the president for eight years. Why didn't he get rid of racism? As if somehow it's their job. And I ended up all the way back, all the way back in middle school sitting in the classroom with the teacher saying something about enslavement or slaves and everyone looking at me as if somehow I should be embarrassed about that or I'm responsible for that or somehow being enslaved was my thing. Here's the secret to all of this. Racism in America is not a black problem. It's a thing black people have to deal with. Racism in America is a white people problem or a majority problem. There aren't enough black people to fix it. We only represent about 13% of the population. We don't hold enough power anywhere. Yes, we need allies to stand with us to amplify our voices because for so long, nobody heard our voices. And even now, think about what happens when Black people stand up, when they are doing well. You get things like Tulsa, where they just basically destroyed the community because there was too much money over there. What is the next step? The next step is we have to go at institutional racism. But the only way to do it is by changing the way we tell the story, by changing the way we look at what happened in this country by understanding that when you talk about history of slavery and enslavement in America, you are talking about an entire group of people whose voices are rarely heard. And when they are heard, it really makes people uncomfortable. We have an administration talking about BLM, the Black Lives Matter movement is a terrorist organization. If you speak up, that's a problem, which is why we need allies. When you look at American history through the eyes of African Americans and their stories, it looks very different from the stories that we as a society tell us. Because if you want to know a people, don't look at the stories other people tell about them listen to the stories they tell about themselves. Thank you. 
Well, that was wonderful. <laughs> and I got to apologize because I got to put my glasses back on. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> I was going to say you need it. You need to get something to drink. Mm. Um, okay. I am going to put you in full speaker mode and we have some questions. Uh, I turn that air back on because it's hot. Um, how long was the average voyage across? Is there any kind of record? There are records, um, but me personally at this moment, I could Google it for you, but I do not have that information at my fingertips. <laughs> okay. Um, Margaret would like to know, were you in theater at Northwestern? Uh, Yes, I was in theater. I studied theater there. I was, Ann Woodworth was my theater teacher. And I graduated, well, the last year I was there, I had really moved away from doing theater for grown-up people. And I was doing a lot of children's theater. Excuse me. So I graduated and uh, I never had a job doing anything else except storytelling. What happened was I was in a piece of theater where I was pretending to be a storyteller. And there was a, a professor there who walked up to me and said, you should be a storyteller. And I said, okay. And then he spent the next year of my life turning me into a storyteller. And when I graduated, everybody just knew that's what I did. Consequently, I've never done anything else. I have been a full-time professional storyteller for 33 years. That's pretty amazing. Uh, there's a, another question. Were you in school with Eva Jefferson Patterson? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. Um, I was in school with Harry Lennox, the guy from The Matrix. <laughs> he did a number of other things. Um, I was in school with Anna Gunn, who was in Breaking Bad, I guess. Yes. yes. She was a buddy of mine in school. <laughs> Uh, I was in school with Anna Gasteyer, who was on SNL for a really long time. She's actually quite a lovely, lovely person. So I went to school with David Schwimmer from Friends. I went to school with him. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you remember the name of the professor that inspired you and guided you? Reeves Collins. R-I-V-E-S Collins. He was a new professor. He was knew when I got there, uh, when, when he found me. So I had been there for a few years. I did this piece. I'd never seen him before. He walked up to me and said, you, you. Uh, the joke, of course, for me was I was, I was a senior at that point. I was getting ready to like, you know, get out of Dodge. And he walked up to me for my next semester and handed me my schedule. And I said, what is this? He said, well, storytelling is only for graduate students. I actually had to sign you up. So here you are. I said, I don't know what else you need to um, graduate, but you have to take these classes. So the first day I show up for this class, I'm with all these grad students. They're all like way older than I am. And I'm sitting in this class looking at all these really old people. They were in their like, you know, 20s, <laughs> mid 20s, a little older maybe. And I'm looking at all these people and everyone's going around talking about storytelling and why they're taking this class and what they think about it. And when it got to me before I could say anything, the professor said, that's Donna. You all know her. She's already a storyteller. She's just here to learn some stories. And then the next person went. So he really was just convinced that this is what I should do. And he was correct. Personally, I think you are extremely lucky that you had someone who recognized your gift and guided you to enhance it. Yeah, I, I, I realized that most storytellers don't come to it right out of school. Most storytellers come through it usually from another career, from teaching. We have people who are, who are lawyers, doctors, all sorts of people become storytellers. But I'm one of the few. And when I, was for, when I first did it, I was probably the only one in the area that just decided to be a storyteller. Okay. Um, Paula would like to know, are there stories centered symbolically on the Nat Turner Rebellion? There are, but you have to understand that 
that in the African-American folklore community, one of the big takeaway lessons is you don't fight. Violence is not the answer to this. Historically, what African-Americans have found in this country is if you fight, they will kill you. There isn't any glory in getting your head broken open. So this idea of nonviolence, the, the way that you fight using, you know, peace, <laughs> it has actually been part of the African-American philosophy for generations. Uh, if you go back to Br'er Rabbit, every single time he used violence, he got in trouble. But when he used his mind, when he was clever, he got out of trouble. So folklorically in the African-American community, they never, 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 never encourage anybody to fight back. They encourage you to think your way out of problems. They never encourage you to, to have an uprising. So you don't find stories in the African-American folkloric community about violence against oppressors. What you find is think your way around it. You're smarter than they are. Get out if you can. But whatever you do, if you lift your fist, you're likely to be in some serious trouble. Okay. Um, Michelle says there's a story in today's Northwestern Daily about racism in, in, in Northwestern's theater department. Did you have any issues when you were in school? Okay, so the thing that, that you have, I think we have to understand about education is that primarily it's written from the point of view of a white man. And so when I was in school some 30 odd years ago, we were studying classical literature, classical theater, Ibsen and Shaw and uh, Bertolt Brecht. And we hadn't really gotten to the point as a country where we were casting people across the color lines. So I know a lot about the, you know, the pinter pause and a lot of other things like that, but there really wasn't any place for me on stage as a black person at Northwestern who didn't sing. I didn't sing or dance. So there just wasn't a lot of opportunity. At least I didn't feel like there was a lot of opportunity. There was no point in uh, auditioning for much of the theater that they had going on because I just couldn't, I didn't see myself in any of it. And there was a African-American theater company on campus and I actually, did, I was never on stage with them, but I did work with them. And it wasn't until I was a senior that we got a black faculty member at Northwestern in the theater department. And she was all right, but she didn't do theater I was interested in. <laughs> So, and I think she was, she was combo women's studies and theater. So she was doing a very particular thing that wasn't interesting to me. I got on stage in Northwestern when I stopped trying to do uh, straight theater and I started doing children's theater. And that same professor, Reeves Collins, he would cast me in anything. So I did Mrs. Witch in A Wrinkle in Time. Uh, Jonathan, oh, how come I can't remember his name? <laughs> it'll come back to me. I think it was Jonathan Turner. Is that? No, Jonathan Wilson. He was a very famous, actually, director in Northwestern, uh, in, in Chicago, but he was working in Northwestern when I was there with his wife, Nan Withers Wilson, and he'd cast me in Summerstock. So I did Summerstock, where I was cross-cast in some plays that I would probably never have been cast in, in, in ever, but Jonathan was doing them, so I was there. But there weren't a lot of opportunities that I felt like being on stage at Northwestern. And my drama teacher, my acting teacher, who I dropped after my junior year, she'd clearly not worked with a person of color before. And so you, at Northwestern, what I felt that I had was a lot of unconscious racism. Nobody there would ever have looked at themselves and thought, I am a racist. It never would have happened. But I got the comments that are from well-meaning people who are exhibiting racism and don't know. For instance, if I could tell you the number of times someone said to me, I don't think of you as a black person. 
And they're trying to be kind, right? They're trying to tell me they don't see color. That's another thing. I don't see color, which brings up two questions. The first is, what is your perception of black people that you must think of me not as a black people to make me okay? If that's what you said, then you have a problem with black people. The second thing, I don't see color. The question, what is wrong with my color that you have to stop seeing it to accept me as I am? When you make statements like that, what you're saying is, I have some really uncomfortable perceptions of black people. And, and this is not your fault. <laughs> like I said, historically, we tell a lot of stories about what black people are and what they do and how they behave. And all those stories have been filtering through our society since slavery days, days of enslavement, right? So you have heard those stories. You've even seen them depicted around you. You have a very clear idea, at least society has, of what a black person is. So in order to deal with something that goes against all those stereotypes, you say kindly, I don't see it. As opposed to saying, my perception of black people and what it means to be black might be wrong. So I will adjust my perceptions. No, I'll keep my perceptions and I will just take you, this one person, out of the box and look at you over here. That way, my perceptions and the fact that I have them, I don't have to deal with that. So that's what I dealt with a lot of at Northwestern. Not outright in your face racism, though there was some of that. Mostly it was the unconscious kind, I call it the good liberal racism. The kind that if you try to confront someone about, they go, how oh, dare you? I thought I was being a good white person. So that was my experience there. Okay. Um, have you spoken in Charleston, South Carolina, and any of the plantations or anywhere in that area? Yes. Um, I have been hired to go to Charleston. They had a big festival there. Uh, let, me, let me be clear about something. This piece that I just did through their own eyes is one of two pieces I do about racism in America. 99.9% .9 of my repertoire is not about that. So I tell stories all over the world and they could be about anything. It's just that this particular show happens to be about race in America because that's what was requested. So yes, I have told in Charleston, I've told all over the country. Uh, I told, well, I've, I've been in Tennessee, I've been in well, it's probably easier to list the country, the states I've not been in. I've never told in Alaska. And I've never told in the Dakotas. I've been pretty much everywhere else. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you tell stories with the Wild Onion storytellers? I did. Nancy Donovan is a good friend of mine. I did tell stories with Wild Onion. And I've also told with the Illinois Storytelling Festival. And I also told at the Fox River, or is it Fox Valley? I think it's the Fox Valley Storytelling Festival, which is in this area. And I also, there's one other, Fox Valley, Jim Mays Festival, Zillinger Storytelling Festival, Fox River, River, River. I think that's the only ones that are there, the big ones anyway. If you like storytelling, check out Fox Valley, check out uh, the Illinois Storytelling Festival, which is now uh, housed by the Dominican University, I believe. And let's see what else is still there. Well, they have smaller festival. Oh, the Evanston Storytelling Festival. <laughs> Evanston started a storytelling festival a number of years ago. And I've also told there, but it's a great festival. It's huge. It gets people from all over the world to come. Okay, great. Um, have you gotten backlash or pushback from any of your stories? Backlash or pushback. I have a piece once. All right. So I have a piece called um, Election Night. And it is a completely personal narrative piece about what happened from the time Obama was elected until his second election. And it talks about the 
the way the politics in our country shifted and the way racism shifted in America after Obama was the president. Because for some reason, people thought we were in a post-racial world. Like racism is over, we have a black president. But it made the people who are freaked out about race go even nuttier. And it also made them think that, that because there was a black president, you could say anything you wanted to, to black people and it was perfectly fine. There was no racism, so you couldn't make racist statements. Consequently, those years when I was traveling around, people said the most outlandish things to me. I mean, I, sometimes I, when I'm performing this piece, I say these things out loud. You can hear the audience gasp in horror that somebody would say that out loud. But, can, you give a, can you give an example? Okay. Uh, I was invited to perform at a very, very upscale um, area. Very, very well-to-do. You can always tell when you're going into a well-to-do community because even the McDonald's looks different. You know, <laughs> they're very cute. They look like little quaint boutiques or something. And so I've, I've, been, I've gone there and they've hired me in. This is, a, this is a group that they bought their own building and formed their own arts council, rehabbed the building for performances and offices, nothing attached to the state, their own arts council, so they could just get bring people in at their whim and have them perform for them, which is lovely. I'm, someday may I be so lucky to live in such a community. But I get there and I, I'm in a little Prius and I like put my Prius between the rolls and the bends and I'm looking around at this gorgeous, gorgeous community, and it's mostly older. A lot of the, the young people have moved away. They, you know, have driven through these giant houses to get here. And I go into the building, and it's gorgeous. And clearly, this is like a social event for this community. Everyone's in there. They're dressed to the nines. And the board, mem the board president is busy, so she's off somewhere. And I am surrounded by the board members, and the board president's husband comes and stands there. And it's right after Obama's second election. And we're all chatting. And the board, and I, somehow or other, we were talking about, I, don't, I, don't, I can't even tell you what we were talking about, but whatever it was, it elicited this response from the board president's husband. He said, well, next time around, I guess I hope I come back as a minority because that's the way to go these days. And I was the only black person probably in the area. And the, the board members just froze. Like they realized what he had just said. And there's a good chance that he says stuff like this all the time. Maybe they all do. I don't know. I'm not there. And the reason why he said it was because during the Obama's era, there was like this us and them thing. Us was all the safe people and them was all the scary, hoardy black people who were going to send on white America and burn it down. But I did not count as a hoardy, massy, you know, murder scary person because I was an artist. I had been invited to hear. I was one of us. So he made a statement that he makes when one of us is present. Because one of us is not usually a minority. And I looked up at him and I said, you want to come back as a minority? Let me tell you, it's not all it's cracked up to be. And that's when he figured out what he had just said. And then the board started laughing because I had made this uh, funny instead of being offended. And he had, his face just drained of color. And he was just like, oh, I'm sorry. I was like, no, nah, sorry, sorry. And I just kept going. It was stuff like that where people would just say like really random, ridiculous, racist nonsense. If we have a black president, that means that, that only minorities are doing well? What? This really rich man, white man had that to say to me? What? <laughs> Didn't make any sense. But it's that kind of stuff. So I did this piece for a group. And the and I did a piece of it. I didn't do the whole hour long show. I did a piece of it. And I had someone complain. I didn't know I was going to a political rally when I signed up to come here to hear this set. So that's the one brushback that I've had. Um, overall, though, when people hire that show, they know what they're hiring. Just like this one, look through my own eyes and you have a description of what we're gonna be talking about. So no, people come because they wanna hear what I have to say, not because they wanna fight with me. Though I'm happy to fight with people. You know, I got nothing going on right now. Okay. Um, I'm just going to interject. Um, I've gotten a couple of uh, questions 
saying that there's no way to exit the poll. If you scroll down, uh, there should be a button that says exit poll. Click that. Um, and if that doesn't work, I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the Zoom technology. It's not me. Um, okay. Uh, the first couple of stories that you told were whimsical, mm -hmm. not based in reality. Mm -hmm. I can see that they were meant to inspire, but that they would give the idea that magic was needed to overcome problems. Are there more reality-based stories that you tell? Yeah. For instance, the white dog, the one that you heard about the girl getting through the, um, through the, uh, the clan. The thing you, you need to understand about folklore is that folklore is about, well, it's about, oh gosh, how to put this so that it doesn't come off the wrong way. When the world around you is so big and so dangerous and you cannot see any way for your little person to get through it, that's when stories about magic become really big and they become part of how we get through. It's not a cultural thing, it's a human thing. Think about all the stories you know where magic happens in a story. They're not magical you know, because people thought magic was real, though, in, you know, to be honest, there were times when people thought magic was real. It's because your own personal need to overcome something is so big, you cannot imagine how you could do it. So you come up with a magical way to solve that problem. But in all of the stories that, that I did tell, despite there being magic in them, always the message is the same. You don't have magic, but you have your feet run. You don't have magic, but you have your brains think. You don't have magic, but you have yourself. Don't let anyone ever take the core of you away from you. So even though the stories are whimsical, they are about a re some really simple truths. And that is true of all folklore. And in fact, that's true of religious stories as well. Religious stories often figure things that are miraculous or unbelievable that you would never see in today's world. The stories aren't about the magic. They're not even about the miracles. They're about how we as people go forward despite everything else going around us. Okay. Do you train or coach young people in storytelling? I have, yes. And I do some mentorship, but I typically am traveling about nine months of the year. COVID has made my life very weird. <laughs> I'm usually not home more than about two weeks at a time over the course of an entire year. So I usually don't mentor because I just, I'm moving too much. This summer, oh, I guess I'll plug this. This summer, uh, or I should say in March when COVID hit, a buddy of mine and I, her name is Sheila Arnold, we started an arts group because a lot of storytellers do not have budgets that allow for them to go for months and months and months and not get paid. And since our work is face to face, it's when we didn't know how it was going to pan out. We started a fund called the Storyteller Relief Fund. And the longer we've worked at that and my friend working out how to do online Zoom stuff like this and me being more and more concerned about storytellers needing good business foundational um, um, good business foundational sense in order to weather this weird downturn. We just recently filed papers to become a 501c3. It's called Artists Standing Strong Together. And this summer we ran a mentoring program with kids. And we had kids from all over the world who worked with storytellers here in America. Actually, that's not true. Some of the storytellers are from different parts of the world. And we mentored kids for two weeks it was a really successful pilot program, and uh, we're going to be doing it again as a group, Artists Standing Strong Together. But I have in the past mentored, I have in the past taught, 
though I don't, I'm not a big fan of teaching anymore. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of effort and other people's children make me crazy sometimes. So <laughs> I, I, I got to say it. Uh, so, but I do mentor people, both young and slightly older. Okay. Um, which theme in your story repertoire best speaks to present culture in America? Which theme? I think the only thing that I can say in present culture in America is that we need to listen. We're quick to dismiss, but we need to listen. And we also need to be more, I think right now America is under threat. The things that, that have made us get this far, we are, we are pushing it to the, the, the current government is pushing it to a breaking point. But the truth is the stories that got us here the way we tell those stories, as a storyteller, my brain works that way, have also responsible for this. If you continually say that using dog whistles, right, like uh, saying one thing to one group and another group thing to another group in terms of what you deal with with race, if you continually dog whistle people and think that it's a victimless crime, Eventually, you elect someone who really does believe all the really ridiculous stories. And when that happens, they have the power to hurt people. Listen, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. And so in terms of the way I tell stories in today's culture, a lot of times I make those statements, listen understand what people in power should be doing. You know, if we ask you to be our steward, then that's not the same thing as asking you to lock us up. Those are two different things. Listen. So the biggest theme I have is listen. And I think if we listen hard enough and believe what people tell us who they are, we will be better off. We'd certainly be better off than we are now. Right. Oh, uh, let's see. What or maybe how do you think we can proceed today with our racial and civil rights issues in order to achieve equality and equity for black and brown people? Well, like I said, black and brown people cannot do this. We can just yell. We don't have enough power in this country to fix this problem. Not that we aren't the people having the problem. What must happen is on a fundamental level in our government, we need to undo the laws we've put in place that cause the systemic racism. That is the only thing that will fix systemic racism. In terms of how we fix the perception, the stories that filter through, it's a question of just reshaping and reframing those stories, which is not an easy thing to do. Most people would not be aware of the ideas that they hold in their head that are indeed racist. They just wouldn't be aware, except for the people who you know, embrace it. It is a difficult thing to face that as a reality. Um, I recommend a whole series of books, but the one I think you should start with is a book called White Fragility. It is a very good start in terms of reading what that means. Is he, he has another book out called How to Be an Anti-Racist. Right. But White Fragility would be a good one to look at. Another one is, I, I'm not going to remember the name of this, but it, it has to do with racism is killing white people. Because the laws that are enacted specifically because you're pretty sure they're gonna hurt black people or they're gonna stop black people from doing something, those laws also really hurt white people and they hurt the middle class. But that doesn't seem to be, so, so it becomes a question of why do people in certain parts of the country vote against their best interest? 
their self-interest. Why would they do that? Well, partly it's because they think they're voting to stop another group of people from doing something. Like it doesn't occur to them that the very laws that they are championing to stop black people from integrating their neighborhoods also hurts their ability to buy houses somewhere else. The banking laws that actually repress a black people's ability to build wealth bring down this, the economics in entire areas. Is, is there's a disconnect between what we're doing and what we want. So fighting for justice for everyone will bring gifts for everyone. So instead of trying to figure out who it's going to hurt, which lots of times people go that route, well, here's an example. Here's a clear one. There were people who decided they didn't like Hillary Clinton's behavior or personality, or they were going to stick it to the Clintons, and so they voted for our current administration. They're also now hurting because of the choice that they made. They didn't, nobody gained anything from trying to make a choice that's against something else. That's the best answer I got. Okay. Uh, let's see. Marianne says, I heard you at a story storytelling festival 30 years ago and hired you to tell stories at my son's birthday party in our backyard in Evanston. I remember this. It was the year of the 17 year <laughs> locust. So you told, I, you told, a, um, is it cicada or cicada? It's cicada. A cicada. <laughs> cicada story. I'll never forget that day. <laughs> and she says, I wonder if you remember it. Obviously you do. Well, that's a great shared memory. <laughs> I'll have to tell you, that's the last birthday party I ever did. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> You already recommended books. Somebody was asking about uh, authors Colson Whitehead and Toni Morrison uh, bring together in, in dreams, historical events, and storytelling. Are there other authors like these you can suggest for us? I'm, I'm terrible at that, um, mostly because I, when I choose to read something, I go totally escapist. My reading list would probably not be interesting to you unless you really like science fiction. Okay. Um, what is the role of black pre preachers as inspiring storytellers? Well, if you've ever been to a black church, I don't know any of you, if any of you have, uh, it is a good time if you go to one that is a Baptist uh, uh, congregation that believes in the the Holy Spirit and hanging it all out there. There's great storytelling in black churches. But just as I said earlier, the call and response thing, uh, black churches are built around the cultural way that Africans actually, from Africa, Africa, how they do large groups of presentation. That did not sound right. If you've ever been to a drum circle, you know, where everyone's beating on the drums mm -hmm. and people are, or if you've been to, uh, a, you know, you're, someone says something, let the choir say amen, all of that kind of stuff, all that stuff is based in Africa. It's actually the same basis for blues and jazz and um, uh, rock and roll, a lot of rock and roll that we, you know, heard, popular music. All of that kind of stuff is based on the African cultural way of presentation. So... Black preachers are simply part of a very long tradition of presenting things that way. They, uh, I have actually worked with ministers on storytelling because, well, gosh, again, let me see. I'm going to wait. I try not to wade into waters that will get me in trouble. Mm -hmm. So let me see. I'm going to do this. Let's see. Let's see how it goes. All religions are based on stories. If I want to know what religion you are, 
All I have to do is listen to you tell me a few stories that you believe, and I will know what religion you belong to. So the better you are at telling stories, the better minister, rabbi, priest, deacon, bishop you're going to be, no matter what religion you belong to. But in the black community, it just so happens that black preachers are very good at it. And those who aren't good at it, they don't really remain black preachers. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, again, I'm going to add some information about the poll. You must answer each question. If you don't answer the question, you can't submit. That was deliberate. <laughs> there are only six questions and they're easy questions. So uh, let's see. A lot of comments about some of the violence that's taking place in Chicago today, but I personally do not think that that's relevant for us to bring up with this performance. If you differ and have something to say about it, please. No, you know, you, one of the things that really struck me uh, during COVID was after we had the lockdown, people were locked down, you started seeing people freak out about not being allowed to go do what they want to do. Armed men showed up in a courthouse with, you know, balaclavas and, you know, machine guns because they wanted to, what, get a haircut? I don't know. When you repress a group of people, every now and again, they explode. A friend of mine who's Israeli was when she first moved to America, she was working in an, a very uh, rundown neighborhood, black neighborhood, very poor. And she was amazed. She said, it looked like someone had bombed the area. And this is what they live in every day. She said, if I had to live like that every day, I would either become very angry or very depressed. And I said, yeah, that, that prep sums it up for a lot of people. This is, this is the world that they live in. In Chicago, we have a lot of wealth disparity. There's lots of money in some pockets and there is a lot of hopelessness and helplessness in other places. Just like my great grandparents, at some point they just had too much and it exploded. Sometimes it's productive and sometimes it's dangerous. When you look at a place that's having a riot or a really furious experience, looking at it from this point and a five minutes ago will not help you understand what happened. You have to go further back and look at what led to it. So I would say, if you know nothing about the area or very little about the area in which this is happening, I would say find out more about the history of the place in question. And then once you do, and looking at what has been going on there, it will probably make more sense. Okay. Um. Judy wants to know, do you do all your own research or do you have a staff to help you find stories and subjects? I do my own research, but I have been 33 years to learn stories. And I try to attend events where I hear new stories. And I do a lot of reading of folktale collections. And I don't do a lot of personal narratives, stories from my own life. Mostly because I, I think that personal narratives give you a, sh a snapshot of a moment, but they don't necessarily tell you a whole story. History is about all the stuff that happened up to this moment, right? So if you want to know why something's going on, you need to go back and figure out what happened. And I'm a pretty avid reader, so I read a ton of stuff. One of the, one of the books I read recently was The History of Salt, which I recommend it was a really interesting book it has to do with where people settled based on how much salt there was in the area anyway it's a, it's a thick book there's also the history of cod which is also like a really interesting book so i like reading histories that explain why stuff happens guns germs and steel i know i said i do a lot of escapist reading but i also read stuff like this every now and again guns germs and steel is a fabulous book if you really just want to look at 
how people got distributed around the earth and why and all this other stuff. So um, I do all the research myself, but partly it's because I'm curious. And so I spend a lot of time reading all kinds of stuff. So I don't need a staff. And if I have a show coming up and I need to learn some stuff, then I guess just learn some stuff. Okay. Uh, let's see. Paula, Pamela says, are you related to Laura Washington? I love your stories. How do I find out where I can hear more of your stories or where our other storytellers are speaking? Okay, well, here, let me do this. I'm gonna put my glasses back on so I can do this. I think I can change my name. I'm going to put my, um, can I name myself? No, I can't. <laughs> you can find me at Donna Washington. That's my name. Dot com. Donna Washington dot com. I do not know Laura Washington. I have no idea if I'm related to her. But my, my people, as we say, my people come from Texas. So if her people do not come from Texas, and she didn't marry one of my brothers, which I know she didn't. I'm probably <laughs> not related to her. <laughs> the, one of the reasons why there are a lot of black people who have the name Washington is because when enslavement was over, who got to pick their own names because they didn't have last names. And so a whole bunch picked Washington. Interesting. Most of the other questions that have come in are actually just rave comments about how much people have enjoyed listening and watching you today. And I will collect all of them and send those to you. Thank you. My pleasure. It has been an honor to host you. Um, I hope we will do this again at some point. And thank you so much for uh, the attention that you gave our group today. We sincerely appreciate it. Well, thank you. I, I'm honored to be here. And who knows, maybe at some distant point in the future when I'm visiting my in-laws, my, my, my father and mother-in-law live in Evanston. So at some point when we're visiting, maybe I could actually make a real stop into the Levy Center. Well, God willing, we'll be back in... <laughs> able to do things in person someday someday all right, all right. stay thank safe you so thank we'll you so much bye-bye bye everybody bye